Instantaneously? That's kind of amazing. Yeah, it gives a backup because uh, I was talking with somebody. Oh, the cat. Hi, kitty. <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I was talking to somebody who had a poor internet connection. So uh, he was in my team and we were, and he was interviewing me and I'm going to put the cat in the. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, and then he just said, you know, Gene, the, the, something screwed up with my recording. It, it didn't record very well. And fortunately, I had recorded yeah. it. So I just gave That's him- That's so a, good to know. I'm going to make everybody do that now. <laughs> it's like, back me up here because, um, yeah, I had something similar happen. Um where something got messed up and the recording like didn't and it's like that so that's good to know so now yeah, it's, it's, it's always good to have a backup yeah so to know that that's a possibility it's like i'm all for i'm all for that yeah. oh my phone's reminding us that our meeting is starting right now <laughs> okay, so, i'm gonna put um, um all of my stuff on airplane mode um I am going to keep, um, cause I'll, I'll keep uh, my phone out just to have a stopwatch to kind of see what our timing timing is. I'm trying to keep the episodes about 40 ish minutes long. Um, but I mean, if we're on a roll and we're seeing all kinds of amazing stuff, then, then, uh, I'll, I'll ride with it. <laughs> okay. Have you, uh, have you been, have you been cross promoting with the people that you're interviewing? Um, yeah, a little, a little bit, um, because there's a couple within, a couple people like within the London Real group that it's like, okay, we can exchange interviews, um, but then like two of those people ended up dropping out. So even though like I participated with that, like I don't know. So some things like there's definitely more that I want to do. In well, that. Let, me, let me ask you this. Do you have a business goal for your podcast or do you just want to attract followers and have people follow your journey all over the world? It's like, follow me. Um, my podcast actually is more about my awareness and my community building for what my overarching purpose and business is that, um, I'm creating a whole, so I'm an artist. And so creating this whole space to be an artist and a healer, and there's all these resources and people that I've learned from. And it's like, how do I make this available to the people that I'm working with? And I'm creating empowered visuals for, now, how do I create? A, you're also a, like a dentist? A dental or? hygienist, yeah. Dental mm -hmm. hygienist, yes. Yeah. So yeah. is your goal to quit being a dental hygienist and do this full time as your sole incoming source or is it just like a hobby or a side hustle no this definitely is the space that i feel kind of compelled to this direction to go in um that the dental hygiene thing i mean it's gotten me spots on medical volunteer trips which are hugely important to me but there's also other other ways that I could still go on trips like this so that's a whole area of investigation but really um that's more of like because it feeds my soul like I want to be a citizen of the world and to have these experiences like I don't I don't want to just go do the touristy things in a country like how are the people really living you know, right. for the most part in, in this space and, and, um, to have those more authentic connections. So there are certain things that I'm investigating with that, but I really don't feel like my daily existence should be spent in a dental office. And so I've been slowly knocking down the number of dental days. Like I've got it down to a bare minimum, but I do ultimately feel like um, while I'll maintain my license, um, I don't feel like I really should be in a dental office on a regular, regular basis. And so I've been working with a few different business coaches and various things. Um, 
I've got one mentor that she works with spirit-based creatives. And it's like, I thought this was something I made up in my own head. It's like, I want to use art for like healing and connection in the world. And it's like, oh, well, guess what? There's like a tribe of women that are actually like doing this. And um, so really shifting my focus because I've done a lot of commission work and all kinds of projects for a long time. But there's definitely a certain genre of artwork that comes from a very different space. It's like when I'm creating out of my own emotional landscape or when I'm taking someone else through this process, I'm creating very different kind of work and it's emotionally cathartic and it draws on all these powers of visual and the idea that you know because like one of the things that like you mentioned that like really um struck me it's like why is it so hard to get out of our comfort zone it's like okay we've got our you know our beliefs and our habits and our natural tendencies you know basically the programs that we're running all the time right and how do we overcome our default programming and because that's how we get into that real potential zone that you talk about yeah, and I, I think um just on observation i think um well i think you have a lot of potential uh because we're not even on the same team in the london real broadcasts and out of all the people who weren't on my team uh you're probably one of the few that I would actually watch what you said. <laughs> I, mean, I, I even saw you on the Star Wars. Uh, day oh, when, yes. When you, when you Princess Leia. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So there's, I think there's a lot of potential there because you, you, you have to have a combination of a couple of things, which you obviously do. You have to have extreme passion for the message that you want to broadcast, which you do. And then you have to have personality and charisma, which you also do. So, ah, thank you, and a willingness so, to dress up. <laughs> yeah. So, if you combine those, then you will be able to build an audience. I was just curious whether you were doing this more as a hobby, or is it something that has income attached to it? I mean, are you going through like the business accelerator, or you want to create it into a business? Have you thought about any of those things? You know, I, um, I definitely do have an interest. I, I would like in some ways it would be really easy for me to get distracted. It like, it's like, okay, like the podcast is to create my sense of community and bring resources and provide actionable tools. And that's part of what my community needs those people that i'm called to serve so i do see how it would be kind of easy for me to kind of get a little bit distracted from what my ultimate purpose is and create the whole business around the podcast whereas it's like the podcast really ought to feed into my higher purpose as an artist and a healer um so I'm kind of contemplating a few things with that. You know, I've had some people recommend it's like, well, you should get your podcast like out on Patreon or something like that. So there's like ways of. Well, before of we get, content. before you really even talk about that, I'm going to put my mm. coaching hat on for a second. Okay, let's <laughs> do it. Um, so I think the, the value of your podcast and the attractive is your podcast is exactly what you're doing just being authentic and letting it all hang out. Uh, the question that you have to answer for yourself is, will you be able to reach a broader audience and do this full time if you remove yourself from just being yourself and then think also part-time as a business person? The only other alternative is you have a sponsor or a partner that just says, okay, I'm gonna sponsor uh, Kira to do this podcast and I'll manage the business in and I'm just going to let Kira be herself. Um, yeah. But if you haven't, if you haven't reached that point where you can just be yourself, do your podcast, do your show, someone else do spread it. your pass and, and, and say, then you have to make a choice at some point where, you know, this dental hygienist thing is paying the bills so I can need to continue to do that. But at what point do I transition to start 
extracting income from my passion, being a business person yeah. and being a podcaster. Mm -hmm. Because it, I've already got a deadline for like, I've set deadlines for myself with the dental thing. Cause it's like, I have to have a deadline in order to motivate myself to make sure that the things that I really want to be spending my time on are, are getting the attention and, and the focus. Well, so, what, you have to, what you have to caution yourself is, is those deadlines are arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be adaptable, but. What you want to do is you want to focus the other way, not how fast I can get out of dentistry, but how, how fast, fast I can get this going the way that how, I want. How mm -hmm. fast can this passion of mine also generate revenue? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's more of the, like the fire that I had to light under my own tail. Exactly. That it's like, okay, this is the way I have to be super proactive in going for what I really do. Right. And that's a different conversation that you would have with me. Like this is, we're still in the pre-interview, but yeah, really. uh, this, this, is, this, is, this is a different conversation you would have with your guests because uh, when we're like, when this goes out, um, how do I cross promote it? To, so you can extract the maximum benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you are, if, if it's a business, then I may point them to services or coaching or life healing yoga lessons or whatever you might be wanting to monetize or sell. But if mm -hmm. it's just, hey, this is a great podcast with this great gal who's spiritual and she does all of these things, then that, that's a different message. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it ultimately is, before you get started on the journey to be an entrepreneur, then you really have to kind of figure out what is the message that I want, not just my followers to know, but your JV partners, your affiliates and your guests to know, because those are the ones that are ultimately going to help you build your influence. That cross promoting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything else is just organic. Yes. Yeah, somebody likes you. They share it with a friend. Mm -hmm. but there's, but the way that your influence spreads is, through the conversations that we are having now, because like I said, I'm recording this, this will, I will cross promote this once I get all of your information. And then Absolutely. I also have behind the scenes that I post to my YouTube channel. So it goes out on video wow. and it goes out on audio. So there's just, yeah. I mean, this is just You're getting hitting started. it from multiple directions. Yeah. But the goal is to help myself and people like you build influence and cross promote each other. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing any of that, then for future guests, you can't deliver as much value to them. Right. So if you want, mm -hmm. you know, really famous guests or well-known healers or, or impasse or whatever you're targeting, if you can provide them a platform to do a lot of online marketing and promotion, then they're more likely to come on your show, not just friends mm -hmm. and family. So, yeah. So, you know, as far as the cross, promoting because it's like I'll always like post like the links to all their stuff and if they've got events or various things going on I put that all in the show notes and um, like one of the ones I did earlier this week she's a yoga therapist and so I like, did like a whole like video it's like hey the episode that's coming out this week and she's got this training and this thing going on is that kind of more of the thing that you're you're talking about like giving well, them those, to those are the actions that you do. Okay. So those are all fine. Uh, the, the thing is, is if we don't know each other, I don't know what benefit there is by you doing that because I don't know who your audience is. I don't know. I don't know how big they are. I don't know if you have any paying clients or customers or anything like that. Right. So it's just you spreading to a group of friends or do you have you know, 10,000 followers on Instagram and YouTube or whatever. So it's the business side of that is, is always the KPIs, what's measurable. So I, I mean, I didn't do that level of research, but you can say, yeah, Gene, when this goes out, you know, my 50,000 Instagram followers are going to know about your podcast because I'm going to cross promote you. And then I said, wow, that's great. Maybe I have a friend that wants to come on your show too. Right. Something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's just something to think about because I, I know that you're, I mean, the great thing is, is the starting point that you created is really compelling, you know, personality, passion, and something really, really kind of unique that does have a following. So 
So that's the good baseline. It's just how you grow it. Do you want to just grow organically? Do you just want to grow organically, be yourself for the rest of your life, and then just see how many people you attract? Or do you want to take off your Kira who I am hat and say, okay, yes, the reality is that I have to be a business person too. And then you put that hat on and say, okay, this is how this becomes a business. And then Mm -hmm. everybody else. That's even been a huge element of like the whole like art thing. It's like, because it's like, you know, it's like, if you want to be an artist and do these things, it's like, it's like, I just want, I just want to be painting and having these conversations and doing stuff. But you're right. There's the huge business element to it. It's like, wait a minute. Now I have to like figure out like these, these things. And that is why I did hire a couple business coaches. And um, ultimately, if I can outsource that that stuff that would be my goal so i could spend the time it's like i just want to be having cool conversations with people who have actionable steps and we can like build the sense of community and then i can be doing these paintings and these like coaching projects with people um that's that you're right that's where i do want to be spending so you, also, time. you also paint yes so yeah so this is actually the entire center of um, my business and the work that I'm, I'm doing. Um, the idea that, cause it's like, if I'm painting for myself out of my own psyche, um, I'm basically doing art therapy exercises on myself. It's like, how do I draw this imagery out of me? How, like a lot of artists, whether it's musicians or painters or whatever, will say, it's like, oh, it's the way I express myself. But it's like, what does that really you know, what does that really mean? It's like they're drawing imagery and symbols and things and like taking things out of their own psyche and they're translating it into a format that can be understood by other people. And so to take other people through this same process to discover what their personal symbols are, what are the, you know, the emotional roadblocks, the things that are getting in their way to take them through that process and create imagery specifically for them uh, is what all of this is about. And that's how it not only is a therapeutic expressive process for me, Mm -hmm. this is the process that I take them, them through as well. And when I paint and create from that space, the artwork is completely different. Um, you know, there's a lot of projects where it's like, oh, can you, like, I just, um, recently, um, a friend isn't like loves her dog so much and wanted a giant portrait of her dog. So I did this like crazy fun, um, giant three foot by three foot portrait of her dog. And it's like, that was fun, but that's also very different than when I'm taking someone through an emotional and a psychological process and creating an empowered visual that we all need anchors. And it's like, how do we stay in resonance with our highest best selves? You know, because we're all going to have high points and then there's going to be times where, you know, we nosedive and (laughs) it's like, oh, like, you know, and it's like, okay, well, how do I stay in resonance with my highest self, I've gone through this process. I remember who I am. Here is a visual anchor. And so that's really what my, my work centers around. And so these elements of being a healer, you know, it's like I'm an energy worker, a Reiki practitioner, like all of these things really feed into, it's like art, art as a healing modality. And this is where, where my true power lies well, and the rest I, of this is just building community and support for all of this well i'm looking forward to experience it because i'm about to be the guest on your show so it's gonna be awesome <laughs> so i want to i'm gonna have you take me on this journey and see what happens yeah yeah well and um and kind of like one of the things that you said um like as far as audiences and stuff it's like so my specific audience people who are looking for actionable tools and like one of the things that i love that you talk about it's like if we don't have roadmaps then like you know we can get all the warm fuzzies we want but if we don't have things to actually like 
impact our lives, make a difference, then what really is the, the point? So everything I do centers around the idea of having actionable tools. So, um, you know, I, I know we talked about this um, a little bit when we were messaging each other. My chief focus is on on women this is the demographic that you know women in their you know late 20s and 30s that this is kind of my micro niche my my particular demographic um like what are their common struggles and emotional blocks and you know some of this is like our interpersonal relationships and so all of the work that you do where it's like okay well there's actually like legit skills that can be taught to improve these, improve I these also, I also, you know, in my mid forties, I also have a lot of experience with women. <laughs> it's like, I don't <laughs> no, know I mean, people think, yeah. No, I mean, in the sense that, you know, I've actually been married once and then divorced and then married mm -hmm. again. Uh, and always it's kind of been like an intercultural relationship. So I have a lot of experience and because I focus on awareness and empathy, then I can really dig deep into, you know, how women feel and how I respond when a woman is feeling a certain way. And that will give women insights on how men feel and how some men can be empathetic, but some men cannot. And how do you respond to that? How do you deal with that? So, yeah. Look yeah, I think that, yeah, like, like this stuff, like the, you know, yeah, the soft skills and AMA, like all of those things that you talk about. And it's like, okay, how do we, how do we heighten our awareness and heighten our empathy? Because that is how we get different outcomes. And um, so I think, yeah, this is where the crossover and our interests are. It's like, you know, you're doing this on like a global, a global scale with your, your work. Um, but well, it's not just the global skills. scale, it's just my right. application is different. Your application yeah, exactly. is that 20 to 30 year old girls, women. My application is for men and women doing business across cultures. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so the similar. exact same, it's the exact same skills. And so while I'm not like specifically like saying it's like, so I'm only talking to the, you know, the girls in this age range. It's like, that's really like, what are the struggles that are happening for women in this this demographic this is who you know these are the things that they are searching for and so that's kind of what what i'm i'm creating so yeah to focus on it's like this is what you can take home and this is what you specifically can do do different and i know you do like a lot of like speaking engagements and everything where it's like i'm teaching you the things that you can actually do and so that's what i'm yeah, super excited to, to get into. Cause you know, we're talking, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, there's the global scale of cross culture, but also we've got our own little subcultures, even the little subculture of our own minds. Like we're all different entities and even our loved ones, these people that we think we know the best. It's like, if we don't have awareness and empathy, then there's going to be that, that disconnect and what a pain point that that is for human beings who are social creatures. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, we've said a lot, almost already enough to make a show, but we haven't started. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, like, let's get on there. And so yeah, that's what... Um, so how do you start the show? Do you do an introduction or how does it... Yeah, so... Because I'm warmed up, I'm ready to go. It's like, we got this, we're ready. Yeah, I think, we, I think we're warmed up, you're right. Um, so yeah, I, I do an introduction to kind of the, the topic and then introduce the show itself. And then I, then I introduce you. So it'll be really obvious um, when it's like, and this is my friend Jean. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so, and this, it's a very conversational, you know, back and forth kind of, kind of format that, um, because I hate the like the really like rigid kind of things. So yeah, we're just having like a really cool, cool conversation is what um, is what I'm. That's what I'm all about. No, so, I get yeah. you. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully the insights from people that your audience would interact with, which is a lot of males, presumably, 
will help them. Yeah, and you know, and I have gotten, um, you know, male interaction with these things too, because it's like, let's be real, like these aren't problems and concerns that are isolated, you know, by a gender or anything. But um, as far as like when I'm thinking, it's like, what is something that is the concern of my micro niche? That's how I kind of go about, it's like, well, who do I interview and what are the skill sets that I want to bring to them? So yeah, I've gotten a lot of guys that will interact with these things too, but as, as far as like, who is my, who is my person that I like, that I'm thinking like, who am I speaking to in my own mind when, when I'm creating, creating these things. So, okay. so right. yeah, I'm ready. All right. <laughs> well, uh, we will rec Oh, here, let's get my stopwatch. Cause I get like really excited. <laughs> I just want to keep, keep talking, but I'll at least watch the, the time. All right. Recording in three, two, one. Have you ever been in a conversation with a friend or a loved one and realized at a certain point that even though you both are speaking English, that something is still getting lost in translation? Maybe you've had a scenario, something like, whoa, calm down. I just I was trying to ask if you still wanted to go. I wasn't trying to rub your face in the fact that you were running late. Have you ever had these, these moments of disconnect in your communication? Or have you ever aspired to something great? Maybe a health plan, learning an instrument, or some other skill, um, a method for structuring your life. You read books and you attend lectures and you get pumped about it. But then do you realize that actually doing the thing or taking a few tentative steps that um, you've gotten caught up in the belief that you don't know enough yet to actually make change in your life to really get started. My name is Kira Marie, and this is the Ariadne Project. In the Greek legend of Ariadne, the hero Theseus is able to overcome unexpected odds, odds that other people had completely failed in, that he defeated a monster and escaped the labyrinth. But the reason that he was able to do so was because he had the proper tools for the job. Today, I am honored to bring you Jean Xu. He is the founder of EME China Consultants and host of the China Leadership Dilemma podcast. He is a master of cross-cultural performance teaching the tools of soft skills and holistic intelligence on a global scale. Gene is teaching people of different cultures how to understand each other's viewpoints and values for successful communication and business interactions. If these tools are important and successful on a global scale, then consider what a difference these essential soft skills could make with your interpersonal interactions. So, are you ready to have these tools placed in your own hands? Welcome to the Ariadne Project, Jean. Thank you, Kira. So happy to be here. And uh, thank you for the great introduction. Um, yes, my, my, my audience is more global business leaders, but I think the soft skills to help people improve their ability to communicate with each other, transcend business. Absolutely. And it's actually, it's actually really applicable to your most personal and intimate relationships because those are the areas where communication breaks down the most often. Yes, and I think communication is one of these topics that comes up for a lot of us. How do we improve our relationships? How do we improve our dynamics with our friends and at work? all these various things. And a lot of it really does come down to our ability to effectively communicate. Like where does that, that breakdown actually happen? Yeah, so the way that I work with my clients and my students, we always start with the foundational soft skills. So 
even for, you know, even in personal relationships between, so most personal relationships are between a male and a female. Okay, so uh, the, the, the differences between the sexes and the differences between a sibling and a parent mm -hmm. and the differences between people of other countries, there's always uh, a different set of values. So cultural differences isn't just, you know, you're from France and, and he's from mm -hmm. Australia. The cultural differences could be gender related. They could be age related. Um, it could be anything. And the key to improving communications really deals with, you know, it's really cliche. You have to learn to listen, right? So a lot of people will say that, uh, you know, some people listen, but they're just listening so they can, until it's their turn to speak and then they speak. So, mm -hmm. so, so some people have developed this thing, they call it active listening, where it, where supposedly you have to pay more attention to what the other person is saying. And this is especially important in, you know, personal relationships between spouses or between boyfriend and girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I take that active listening to another level and mm -hmm. I call it proactive listening. So what does proactive listening mean? Proactive listening means that you have to be empathetic to what the other person feels. Okay, so for example, uh, we all know that uh, females every month during a certain period of time, <laughs> they, have, they may have elevated levels of hormones. So mm -hmm. um, they may not be themselves and they may react more emotionally or, or negatively to certain things that stimulate them or that frustrate them. Mm -hmm. So the key for uh, any people in, that are males in your audience is how do you empathize with that? Obviously, as a male, I would never know what it feels like to have hormonal imbalance. Hormonal sabotage. <laughs> right. But what I have to do is I have to try to imagine mm -hmm. what that would like. And so I've been with my... Now, I've been married with my wife, my current wife, so I've divorced once and, and I'm remarried. So with my, with my wife now of going on seven years, um, in the early part of the relationship, uh, I was unable to be empathetic to any type of kind of emotional outrage during certain periods of the month. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I'm a very logical thinker, and <laughs> which means that things that are irrational and emotional don't make sense to me. And mm -hmm. then what I and then what I try to do is I try to use logic to counteract something coming towards me that is just completely illogical. Oh man, how'd that work out for you? It never works out. <laughs> It never works out. So you have, to, you have to imagine that she would say something kind of over the top because she's naturally emotional or more emotional as a female. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I would just, I would not only think this, but I would say this. I would say, oh, no. I would say that's <laughs> ridiculous. Okay. So you have to imagine the dynamic between two people. Uh, one person is emotional and then the other person is telling that person she's ridiculous. <laughs> it's like, you want to see ridiculous? Like, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so what happens is, and this happens, this is a microcosm of what happens in cross-cultural communications too. Yes. Is because I'm unable to be empathetic to what she is feeling at the moment of emotional, you know, outbursts. Uh, I'm not able to de-escalate the situation. And in fact, mm. my logical reasoning further exacerbates something that was very, <laughs> very innocent and very, very minute. Okay, so, so what has happened over time is I've developed greater empathy, which means that when my wife is 
suddenly angry about something totally ridiculous, I no longer think it's ridiculous. And yeah. when, when the emotions are going, so you have to imagine, and I'm sure you can empathize with this, is when you're not, when you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're emotional, regardless of what time of the month it is, you say things that presumably you might regret, but you say a lot of things that you don't really mean. Mm. And, and, and the key for me is not to react to the words. So I've actually developed this system mm. where, and, and, and I use this in cross-cultural communication. So for example, mm. me and as American advising business leaders who travel to China, so the, the yes. cultural differences between China and the U.S. are at complete dichotomies with each other. Mm -hmm. So even uh, Gert Hofstede, who's measured the cultural dimensions, uncertainty, avoidance, power distance, for all the countries in the world, you'll always see that on all of these scales, China's up here and Americans and British and Germans are down here. We're always at opposite ends. Oh, the gap is pretty, pretty the wide. Gap is, the gap is just... They're, they're complete dichotomies with each other. Mm -hmm. And when people are communicating in relationships, uh, when your wife or your spouse or your girlfriend is not reacting as you would expect logically, at that moment in time, her values, because they're so emotionally driven, are also at opposite ends of the spectrum. So you can just imagine every common argument between a man and a woman. The woman is at the height of emotions, which is why she is reacting. And then the way that men generally try to counteract that is they try to be logical. They try to reason and rationalize. <laughs> and they say that, they try to say, that's ridiculous. All I'm doing is X, Y, and Z. Why the hell are you getting so upset? That's not my intention. What men are failing to realize is it has nothing to do with the words that are coming out of her mouth. And I've actually written this article. It's called that if you want to, I don't remember the exact title, but you have to, it's, it's, it's talking about the difference between Chinese thinking and American thinking. And, and the general thought is Chinese think in a very circular manner. And when you think in a circular manner, that means that what you actually feel is somewhere in the center of the circle. But the way that you express how you feel is what people perceive on the periphery of the circle. And what happens is, is when we as people who are trying to improve the communications, when we engage with people on the periphery of the circle, we're only engaging with the symptom or an outcome of actually what they feel. And yeah. the only way to actually reach them is to direct, and I have this arrow, you have to direct your empathy towards the center of the circle and ignore all of the negative things on the periphery. To get down yeah. to the real root of like this is what's creating the disconnect and yeah, like, I can just... the root of what's going on for this person, that value that they're basing all their reactions from. Yeah, I can just share a story with you. So one time, you know, obviously when you're being called all of these ridiculous things in the heat of an argument and, oh, you, no. can't, and you can't be escalated no matter what you say, uh, obviously it's normal, it's human to actually start getting upset, angry, frustrated, and emotional yourself. Mm -hmm. What I have been able to do, because I've been training myself on this, yes. on this what I call cross-cultural performance mastery, I can remember uh, having this argument with my wife that was based on something really, really uh, small and insignificant, mm -hmm. but no matter what I said, it would escalate further. And and I just suddenly, but I never elevated my voice. I never got frustrated. And I suddenly, I just smiled at her. Oh. And I just smiled at her. And, and, and she was kind of confused. And I, <laughs> and, and I said, you know what? 
I think I am the luckiest person in the world. And she says, and she didn't, she, I don't know if she's, I don't know if she said why or not, but uh, basically I explained to her, I said, I think I'm the luckiest person in the world because it's only through your emotional uh, reactions that I know you love me. I know you need me. If you weren't behaving like this, I would have no idea that you even cared. So because you, I'm turning the negative into a positive. Wow, what a reframing. Exactly. Yeah. Reframing is the right word. And, and when I put it in those terms, then suddenly it de-escalated. Well, and I find it interesting because um, there's a Stephen Covey quote that I really like that that totally feeds into this, that he talks about seek first to understand and then be understood. That, you know, it's our human tendency to, it's like, we just want to be understood. And, and so we can be like simultaneously just like screaming to be understood. But if we can slow down just enough like you did to actually hear what was being said and understand the root of it to understand that then will eventually allow and open up space for you to be understood as as well yeah successful communications between two people is both persons both people's response both parties mm -hmm. responsibility mm -hmm. so um i'm only doing my end your end yes right so uh, for you and the people in your audience, if they're mainly females, if you want to be understood, you have to realize that screaming well, doesn't I mean, bring people in. Yeah. <laughs> All right? Yeah. So, so it works in the opposite direction. If you're screaming that, I just want to be understood, and then you're, you're, you're literally and figuratively screaming at somebody who you feel is not understanding you that doesn't actually yeah. bridge the gap to bring people closer. Yeah, that we've got to, like you said, to be responsible. It's like, okay, like I can do, I can do my part and have my, my own awareness. I am in control only of my own behavior and to acknowledge that that kind of behavior is completely ineffective. It's like that there's, you know, so this feeds into these ideas of awareness and, and the empathy from, from the other side is yeah, as so well. For, for most people, uh, when they are expressing themselves, however they express themselves through their emotions, uh, being effective is irrelevant at the moment, right? When you're, in, when you're in a state of anger or a state of emotions, you're not thinking about how do I, get this person to understand me. You're more thinking about, uh, you want to let that person know he is not understanding me. Your, mm -hmm. goal, your goal consciously or subconsciously isn't rational, right? Mm -hmm. We're just about, acting out of our pain, yeah. Ex exactly, so when we're talking about rational goals, then yes, <laughs> we should not yell and scream if we want people to understand <laughs> us, okay? But you, the thing is, is so that's why there's two skills that I think are essential. One is, of course, empathy, which is aiming your empathy toward the center of what people think and they feel. Mm -hmm. but the other is awareness, self-awareness, right? So you have to be aware of what your own emotional state is at different, at different types of engagement or interaction, right? So you can be aware that at my moment of frustration and anger, I don't care about consciously or subconsciously, I don't care that you understand me. I just want to let you know that you don't understand me. That's my only objective mm -hmm. by screaming and yelling. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is, is as a person, not even as a female, as a person, once you develop the awareness that, okay, during these periods of arguments, which I, end up regretting later because it harms the relationship. I waste a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really, you know, it's a really waste that, you know, I, I could have been doing this 
with with my project and now I spent the whole day being upset and it just really yeah, wasn't worth that, it. <laughs> that energy, yeah. Yeah, so what happens over time is, is you start to develop the ability to look at yourself while you're acting. And then over time, your unconscious self can be taken over by your conscious self. Your unconscious self has 100% control of you during your anger and frustration. What, is, what I have experienced is I've developed greater empathy and awareness, what I call the essential self skills that matter, is I've started to realize that during these periods of time, my conscious self can take more control over my unconscious self, no matter what is happening. And over time, my wife can say the most hurtful, ridiculous things. And I don't smile because I'm disingenuous. I smile because my logical mind, my rational mind, my conscious mind is now won the battle against my subconscious mind and my unconscious mind. Hmm. I'm aware of my subconscious biases. I'm aware of my cultural biases. I'm aware of my gender biases. I'm aware of my racial biases, whatever they may be. And then I'm more able to logically change or adjust what I call AMA values. AMA values are your attitude, your mindset, and your approach. Okay, these are the only things that can influence the perception of others. Okay, people don't care how smart you are. They don't care what knowledge you have. They only know what they feel. And what they feel yeah. is directly reflected in what is your attitude. I mean, you can say the most beneficial thing, but if you say it in a really condescending way and you feel oh. you're looking down on somebody, it doesn't matter how good the advice is, it's not going to be accepted. Not going to be well received. Yeah. Right. So that's what? That's your attitude. Mm -hmm. That's your attitude. So the goal of cross-cultural performance mastery is actually to make adjustments over time to the attitude that you have where a more positive attitude or a healthier attitude becomes natural. In the beginning of this journey, you really have to force yourself. You have to step out of your body and in the moment you have to say, I know I'm angry. I know this is what I want to say, but you, you know, damn it, I'm just going to stop myself. Okay. And that's part of that, that awareness. So like catching yourself in the moment, like this is the emotion that I'm feeling. I know that when I am in a state of anger or upset that I typically behave in a particular way. So, so in those moments to really start identifying like what is going, going on with us is then what's ultimately going to allow us to start altering our mindset then. Exactly. But in the beginning, uh, you're consciously trying to have awareness. But when, when emotions come and, and hormones come or whatever you want to call them, it's hard to be conscious of that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a really, really gradual process. What, so what happens is once your attitude, so you can change your attitude really, you can only really infinitesimal the attitude changes that you can actually make. So you can actually say something disingenuous. You can say, and you can force it out. You can mm -hmm. force the words out because you're controlling it and you're managing it, okay? The goal is not that because ultimately it needs to be sincere. In yeah. order to get from a state where you're out of control to a state where you're partially in control to a state where you naturally aspire to be that's where it's a journey to actually develop what i call the essential soft skills that matter so you're developing greater awareness self-awareness situational awareness cultural awareness so you understand everything in the context of of why it's happening and what you can do actually to reverse the negative trends and move things in a more positive direction and then you're empathetic 
to the people that you're communicating with. And when you have these essential soft skills, then what you start to do is first you force yourself to adjust your attitude, mindset, and approach. Okay. Over, but over time, these adjustments become natural. So the example that I gave in the early stages, as I knew that I wanted to de-escalate these arguments with my wife, you know, I would kind of force myself, but then eventually I would lose control, <laughs> right? Because eventually, okay. eventually people are still people. It was mm -hmm. only until my attitude and mindset changed that it became natural. Suddenly the negative words that were coming out of her mouth didn't feel hurtful or negative. And that's, that's almost like, for me, it's almost like a mystical state. Hmm. And, and, and empathy is the same thing. You know, empathy to me is a skill. And, yeah. and, and, and sometimes the level of empathy that I think I've developed, it's almost like a mystical power. And what I actually have to do, because I'm aware, is I don't want to let people know that I know what they're thinking and know what they're feeling. Because people don't like that. <laughs> it's, it's like Deanna Troy of Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, you know, sometimes people don't like it that you know what they're thinking. In fact, when you tell them, I know what you think and I know what you feel and I know why you're doing this, that actually has the reverse, reverse yeah, that can outcome. Like Right. So I used to tell my wife, you know, I know exactly what you're feeling and I know you're frustrated and I know it's hormonal. So you just have to realize that too. That doesn't work. Oh yeah. That, <laughs> that don't work at all. <laughs> right. Well, and so this idea of empathy as a skill, because I think a lot of people it's like, Oh, well, I'm just not naturally empathetic or, or whatever. And it's like, but no, that this is a skill, which means it can be learned and it can be practiced. And, you know, obviously we've demonstrated the absolute need for empathy here because it helps us see and understand people in context and that helps with the mindset and all of those, those really strategic, important, important tools. So how would you recommend that we start training our empathy and learning this skill? Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's actually a really good question. So everybody naturally has a different level of self-awareness and empathy yes okay so some people have have more some people will have less it, mm -hmm. it it all comes from their experiences so i'll just give you an example um gary vaynerchuk which a lot of people know he always preaches and practices extreme empathy but mm -hmm. he you know i used to watch his earlier videos and every time somebody says hey gary so how do you develop empathy he would always pun on that question. He goes, I don't know how to develop it, but I'll just tell you that I know how I got it. It was because he, he was an immigrant. So when he grew up as an immigrant, he had to, he, he, he was in this environment where uh, he really had to be aware of being a minority, being poor, having to work hard, all of these things. And through that, he developed a greater awareness of his surroundings. I have the same experience. So I grew up, yes. I grew up in the South, Atlanta, Georgia. And I grew up there in the, in the 80s and early 90s, which meant what? Which meant that when I went to elementary school, there were no other, not just no other Chinese kids in my, that were classmates, there were no Asians at all huh. <laughs> at all <laughs> from grade from grade from kindergarten to i would say ninth or tenth grade i didn't see another asian kid in my school okay so what did that do that meant that i was always self-conscious of mm. the way i looked i always felt i looked different than other people because i had black hair and slanty eyes right and everybody who saw me for the very first time, they always assumed I knew karate because the only Chinese person <laughs> they knew of was Bruce Lee. I'm serious. 
So that was actually a good thing because it's like you aren't born knowing karate. <laughs> it, it, it was like, well, that was a that was a that was a cultural stereotype. Stereotype mm -hmm. in that period, in that period mm -hmm. of time, you got to remember in that period of time there was no Yao Ming, there was no China was not so powerful. Nobody knew anything about China other than Bruce Lee. So everybody. Gotcha. Like, especially the kids, all the kids. Just, like this is their only association in right. point of reference. They just thought all Chinese people knew karate. So that was actually fortunate for me because people didn't want to bully somebody who knew karate. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> right? but, but my point is, is that dating was really hard for me in high school because I was mm. so self-conscious of how I looked and how people might perceive Hmm. as being Asian or being Chinese. And what that has translated into later in life is because such an, you know, you have to learn language at an early age. Mm -hmm. I developed awareness at an early age because I was so self-conscious, right? I was always thinking about what do people, will, will this girl want to go out with me even though I look like this, right? Hmm. That, I mean, this was again, you know, 20, 30 years mm -hmm. ago. This is, this is, this, I, I'm, I'm going back and, and this is how I mm -hmm. felt back then. Yes. So as I progressed with my career and I started realizing, you know, people are attracted to me, not just because of my outer appearance, but for other reasons. Uh, then I started developing more confidence, but the awareness never left. So when I mm -hmm. began my journey to develop greater awareness or self-awareness, it was actually easier and more intuitive, okay? Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, um, when people ask, how do you develop, or how do you, they say, can I learn awareness and empathy? The answer to that universally, not just by me, but by all experts in this field is no. You can't learn awareness and empathy, and, and I can't teach you awareness and empathy, okay? So they, they, they say, well, then how do I get more of it, how to develop it? So it's a journey. And it begins with two very, what I've observed, it begins with two very, very fundamental um, disciplines, okay? One is imagination, okay? Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to deploy imagination if you wanna be empathetic to other people, right? So for example, in my wife, I have to really imagine what it's like to be at the peak of anger and frustration and then not being able to say rational things. And once I can imagine what that feels like, because I've been angry before, then I can empathize that, you know what, I really shouldn't listen to the words that are coming out of her mouth. I should just be empathetic to the emotions that she's feeling and try to resolve it that way as opposed to debating with her based on what's coming out of her mouth because her mm -hmm. what's coming out of her mouth is already irrational because of the state of emotion. And then, so I have to always imagine that. So imagination is really important. Mm -hmm. The second is curiosity. Yes. But it's not just, it's not just random curiosity. It's no. what I call purpose-driven curiosity. If you want to be a, what I call proactive listener or a good listener, you have to genuinely be curious purposefully why people say the things they say and what they value and what they care about. And what happens is you have to deploy greater imagination and purpose-driven curiosity to all of your engagements with other people and start to observe outcomes. Start to observe people's expressions. Start to observe uh, of how people react to different things. And over time, this acuity accumulates. It accumulates to the point that you start, first you know saying certain things causes an every reaction. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. as you make these adjustments to your attitude, mindset, and approach, then not saying those things becomes more and more natural over time. Mm -hmm. So 
becoming, and I just call all of this, becoming a master of cross-cultural performance. So the training and the development to be, become a master of cross-cultural performance is just never ending, right? No, I'm but this is a continuous evolution in collecting these data points, yeah. Absolutely, and, and at first it's really hard. At first you're gonna make mistakes, and at first it's very conscious. It's conscious decisions to say this. It's conscious decisions to try to behave like this. Over time, and I can testify that because I've accomplished it myself, over time, it becomes natural. It's become so natural that I almost know what, I almost feel like I am in, an impact. I almost feel that I know what people are thinking, but I'm also aware that nobody wants you to know what they're thinking. So you just have to try to strategically say things that would connect with them on an emotional level. To make them yeah. understand that they are being validated. Well, actually it's just to make them feel good. They don't have to feel anything logically. They just have to feel good emotionally, right? So if I know that you are struggling with some aspect of your personal life or professional life, I shouldn't go in and say, let me help you with that. What I would probably choose to do is just convey to you that I'm struggling with the same thing. Because not that it's something that I really want to talk about and I really need your help with, but I know that this is a way to pull you closer because I'm empathetic and I already know without you telling me that you are already struggling with this. Well, you just connected a few interesting, interesting points that it's like, okay, yes, seeking to put people in context. And I think there's an element of giving people the benefit of the doubt. Like you have, you know, with your wife at some of these times, it's like, okay, I know that this is not really what you mean. I have enough other data points to like know, know that. So I can understand I'm putting you in context. This is what's really, really going on. So the idea of giving people the benefit of the doubt and you wouldn't have been able to do that if you hadn't gotten curious. It's like, what is her state? And why would you know this be reacting this way? But then the other point that you brought up is this kind of point of human connection where that act of vulnerability that you talked about, where it's like, hey, this is you know something going on in, in my in my world, vulnerability is actually you know it's like it it can seem kind of scary but that that's one of those really powerful ways to connect on a very human level that it's like we are all human and we have this shared human struggle so i find i find that interesting that you you, you bring that into the equation no you're exactly well. right vulnerability weakness uh you know, things that you're afraid of, your fears, your vulnerabilities, your weaknesses. M most people are afraid to admit that they have them. Yes, yes. But what I tell my clients and, and my students and the people that I mentor or the people that I coach, mm -hmm. these are the gateways to mm. bring people closer. Right. If mm. you are there, there's something I can't remember. I can't remember. Some psychologists used it. It's called like the broken wing syndrome or something like oh, that. Oh, it's like you want to go around saving all the little broken birds. Kind yeah. Of thing. And what that means is, is most people always want to feel that they can be helpful. Yes. And if you can somehow convey through your, you know, not with your words necessarily, but with your mm -hmm. kind of aura that mm -hmm. you're accepting and in need of help and guidance from somebody else, then wow, that's just an invitation to open up a much deeper conversation with somebody, right? If you're like, mm. if you're like, you know, if the persona that you per portray is, I'm really confident and I know exactly what I'm doing. And, you know, I just want to help others. Well, you're also going to turn off a lot of people with that persona. Yeah. 
people, right? Because, you know, that doesn't lead to a mutual connection. You have to remember, yes. people have to keep in mind that before you can help anybody, somebody, the other person at first has to connect with you and trust you. Ooh, yeah, that and, trust, yes. And what most people forget, in, and this happens in cross, this happens with successful executive leaders when they go across over the ocean and do begin negotiations, is they forget about, you have to make a personal connection first. Because especially in a business meeting, nobody cares what you say because everybody knows you're only going to say what's in the best interest of you and your business. Hmm. People make decisions based on what they feel. Yes. And if you focus on how other people feel, which requires some imagination and some purpose-driven curiosity, yes. if you focus on that, then suddenly you will realize that the outcomes are completely different. And the reason that I'm on the mission that I'm on now is because I have felt the difference, but it's hard for me to explain how that feeling to somebody else, because until you felt it yourself, you don't know how empowering that is. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's, it's just like people can imagine in personal relationships. So personal relationships are always a good example. Mm -hmm. When I was, when I just, when I was using, unconsciously using all of my skills to communicate more with my wife, and we de-escalated de an argument that might have gone on till the next, till daylight. Oh. You know, <laughs> I, I saved both of us a lot of emotional distress. Uh, we were able to have a good night's sleep. Mm. We got closer because we connected on a deeper level. I mean, there are so many benefits that people only realize in hindsight that yeah. I realize in foresight. People think that's what intuition is. People think I have great intuition because some of the things that I predict, I mean, behavioral things that I predict, I mean, this is down, this is, this goes as, as, as specific as I would told my wife um, three months before it happened of two people that I barely know, I said, they're going to get divorced. And my wife was like, no, they're not. And then they get divorced. Oh. <laughs> wow. Right? I did met, you to get to a point to... That's empathy. That's, that's mm -hmm. being aware of what's going on. I met somebody in our, this was a, Another thing that happened, I met somebody in our, we live in this community, apartment homes community. And, and there's this, we, we do these, you know, exercise classes. And mm -hmm. this, this girl uh, just started talking to us. And, and I, I'm not going to go through the details of the conversation, but uh, it ended up was, I, I was going to guess what her, um, what her career is, what she does. And a lot of people were guessing and nobody got it right except me. And I basically wow. said, you're a doc I said, you're a doctor. And she was so like, you picked out these details this more. Subconsciously, intuitively, because I'm proactively listening to everything that she says. I can't tell you what the, what the cues were. I just know that my acuity has been elevated. Acuity is a combination of awareness and empathy. That acuity mm. has been elevated to a point where it provides me really something that can only be described as clairvoyance. And suddenly things just, so that's what intuition is. Mm -hmm. Some people have good intuition. Some people don't have good intuition, but intuition actually can be developed and it can be trained. And in my mind, intuition is a combination of having greater awareness and having greater empathy, right? And, and once you combine those skills, then you can almost predict outcomes to extreme accuracy. It's amazing. 
<laughs> well, and I love this idea of, you know, it's like, okay, we can change, you know, we can, by cultivating these things, we can start changing the outcomes that, you know, we hear a lot of times that the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different outcomes. But here we are, we're proactively doing different things in order to get these different outcomes, whether it's being able to de-escalate a conversation or being able to have that proactive listening, like so integrated into who we are that we're starting to pick up these kind of details. And one of the things in that, in your work that um, I found really interesting, you kind of created this scale. It's like, okay, we all know like a lot of the, we can identify a lot of these things where it's like, yeah, that's where I want to, to get to and to achieve these like certain abilities. But then we also exist in our, in our comfort zone. And you defined that as, you know, our comfort zone is these, these knowns and these predictable outcomes. And so if we really do want these different results, we've got, to be doing different things, but then why, you know, we can know the things, like we can know some of these things, but why is actual change so hard, hard for us as humans? You know, it's interesting that, you know, there's a lot of things that sound really cliche. Um, and, and you just used one, what, what was it? Um, I can't remember what it was, but there's another one. And, and it's basically, it says hope is not a strategy, right? Mm. And, these are, and these are just cliches, uh, yes. things that people say. But what I've discovered is how do these things become sayings that people use? There's actually a lot of behavioral science underneath why these sayings got elevated. Mm -hmm. right? So people use these not really knowing what they mean. <laughs> but they know how they apply. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how you can apply certain things to yourself to achieve what these cliche sayings are trying to help people accomplish. So hope is not a strategy. So most people hope for the best, right? And they hope that their current modus operandi, their current state of who they are, they just hope that it works. Right? Mm -hmm. And what most people are unwilling to do is they're unwilling to change. So the answer you're to your question- You're biologically wired to be afraid of change. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're biologically wired to, to, to stay in a place of comfort. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what I have elevated myself to is, and I use this as my saying, is- and I help my clients and people that I mentor do this, I always begin with some foundational things that they should work on. And one of those is to embrace uncertainty. Mm. Once you learn to embrace uncertainty, so it's hard for people who've had a lot of negative experiences to, break, to embrace uncertainty. So if you've had a lot of negative experiences, you have to be aware of that. Because the key to embracing uncertainty is connecting the dots and where uncertainty led to something positive. And hmm. then, right? So when I look back in hindsight, I can see that, oh man, these things, I was really just getting out of my comfort zone, progressing into an unknown, but wow, look what happened afterwards. I met this person. I did that. Like just for example, taking the London Real Broadcast Workshop. I had to pay money, but in addition to the money, I had to com commit myself to eight weeks. That was embracing uncertainty. Nobody could predict mm -hmm. what the outcome of this investment of time and money would achieve, right? Mm -hmm. But intuitively, I felt that this was a good fit on some of the areas where I was weak, and that was recording myself. I'm actually not very comfortable recording myself. In fact, before this Broadcast Yourself workshop, I'd actually never done a vlog. Hmm. So you um, were really pushing your comfort, your comfort zone here. Right, but I do that proactively now. Because mm -hmm. I know without getting out of my comfort zone, I can never hope to achieve something extraordinary. And most mm -hmm. people, not only are they unaware of their weaknesses, but they have 
they're afraid to acknowledge them and they try to suppress them and hide them. What I do is I know these are my weaknesses and I engage in activities to help me overcome them. Right. So, for uh, and so yeah, to start closing this, this gap, because um, one of the things that you've brought up, it's like, it's easy to get almost addicted to, these ideas of like, you know, self-help or these various things. It's like, oh, well, you know, I want to, you know, meet this goal in my life, but, um, you know, I can't really be expected to change anything until I go to, you know, one more seminar and do one more thing and, you know, do all this that we almost start just collecting things, but we can almost use that as a disguise and an excuse for not changing our behavior yet that it's like oh well I, I still have to acquire acquire more as opposed to it's like okay I know this one little piece right now and I can act on that one little piece right now so in your example it's like okay I feel like I need to start a podcast it's like but I like ooh, I don't feel comfortable you know with with that and so you deliberately pushing your comfort zone and it's like okay well I will start in this one way to start pushing my comfort zone, to be proactive in, in, that, in that way, to take whatever small step that you can do right now. Absolutely. I mean, that'll start closing so, the gap. So some of these things are just natural to our personality and, and these are habits. So you can't, telling somebody to embrace uncertainty doesn't lead to them embracing uncertainty. No, <laughs> right? no. So, so uh, when, when I work with people, I always say embracing uncertainty is the goal that we were aspired to. And okay. I acknowledge that there's a process and a progression between getting from point A to point B. So that frames this journey in a more palatable kind of framework where people just say, well, yeah, it's, that's easy to say, but you know, how do you do that, right? So, so that's, again, that's another level of awareness. A lot of people give advice as if you just have to, if you just follow my advice, you'll see the difference. But that's not how people behave. That's not how people, that's how not people's minds work. If we, could, if we could all be successful just by living to advice, then everybody would be successful. Everything, yeah. <laughs> right? So, so what is it in your training to like, get people from going to hearing the nice advice to actually being able to make changes? It starts with first understanding yourself. You have to be honest with who you are, right? You first Is there a have process to... you take people through to start getting radically honest with themselves? Uh, it's not, well, some of that, so if I'm, if I'm mentoring or coaching you one-on-one, -on -one, then the first thing is for us to develop a level of trust. Absolutely. And then, I, and then once you trust me, I have no ulterior motives for exposing you. Mm. Then, then we can start breaking down those walls and breaking down those barriers. Okay. So, if somebody uh, wanted to go through some exercises themselves to start having this kind of self awareness, because you know, definitely in these coaching sessions and in our interpersonal relationships, to have that that trust, but are there any exercises or anything that you might recommend? Like, how do I start for all of our audience right now? What is like something that they could do today to start cultivating their own self-awareness? Yeah. So it, it's, it sounds simple, but mm -hmm. it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. Sometimes it's almost impossible, but for somebody who wants to do exactly what you just said, you first have to begin with the outcome. That's the starting point. You first have to say, this is the person that I want to be. This is how I want to be perceived by other people. And because of this conversation that I just heard with, with Jean and Kira, I know that if I can reach this outcome, then a lot of things in my life will be different. A lot of my relationships will improve. Mm -hmm. You start with the outcome that you aspire to attain. And Begin with the end in mind. Then you work backwards. Okay. What most people do with advice is they, is they don't start with the outcome. They just say, do this and you will achieve that. 
but nobody's going to do that because yeah. in order to do that, it's a long process to be able to do that. Now you can do it once or you can do it twice, but the goal isn't to do it once or twice when you're conscious of it. The goal is to do it naturally and make it become a habit. To, to yeah, close that gap between the comfort zone and our potential zone. Yeah, to close, close that. So that what gap. I help people, so people have to have a different mindset and a framework of how everything works. It, it's amazing that most people don't even know how their own psychology works. Seriously. So I'll just give you an example. So um, when people have negative outcomes, for example, you have, a, you have an argument with your boyfriend or your spouse, mm -hmm. or you have an argument with your boss or your coworker, mm -hmm. the natural tendency is always to blame somebody make an excuse say okay this is the reason why that happened oh man he was just you know he was just being stupid and and, and he just doesn't understand the, 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 the thing that people have to understand is complaining making excuses judging other people leads to nothing positive for yourself yes okay you have to break it down into two simple categories things that you can control and things that you cannot control. And actually the only thing that you can control is yourself. Yes. And, the, on influence. and the only levers that you can control to influence the perception of other people are your AMA values, right? So you start to understand how does this game work? How does this game of working with other people, communicating with other people, developing, fostering positive relationships with other people, how does this game work? What are the levers that I can actually manipulate? Okay, and then if you think of it as a game and you have these things that you can control to change the outcomes, and actually there's only three things that you can actually manipulate or control, and these are your own attitude, mindset, and approach. So the goal in the training that, that we take people through is making adjustments to their AMA values, starting to connect the adjustments with what they perceive, right? Once you start to perceive people reacting differently, once you start to perceive eventual outcomes becoming more favorable, once you start to perceive fewer wasted arguments, fights, and debates. Yeah. Once you start to experience and you make that connection, connection, then those adjustments become more and more natural over time. And that is the journey to become a master of cross-cultural performance. It's a framework. Things that we learn, you have to think of your, your body as a system, okay? Everything that you learn, all of the books that you read, all of your experiences, all of the knowledge that you acquire, you listen to your favorite influencers podcast, everything that you download, mm -hmm. that goes into what I call a proverbial toolbox, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you learn to speak a foreign language, that goes into the toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. If you learn to speak Chinese and you meet a Chinese person, you can take that tool out and use it, communicate with somebody in Chinese. Now, what I always say is knowing how to speak Chinese doesn't mean you know what to say in Chinese. Ooh, yeah. Like, what so, is the proper application of this tool? Right. So, one, so it's like three pillars. Our bodies are a system, and there are three pillars that control the system. One is the things that we learn. That's mm -hmm. all our knowledge. That just dump, gets dumped into our toolbox. Mm -hmm. the other is the things that we develop okay and the only things that i think are worthy of development are self-awareness and empathy these are the essential self skills that matter these are things you have to develop okay now having knowledge that you've learned and having skills that you develop these by themselves actually don't make a difference at all the difference comes in the third category which is things that you adjust and the adjustments that you make are with your attitude, mindset, and approach. So 
the knowledge, the, the skills, and the levers that you can control, this forms the system of how you are perceived by other people. Well, and this idea of that, it's like, okay, just knowledge isn't enough, that it's knowledge plus action, those behaviors, that that's what actual wisdom is. So I guess in conclusion, to kind of wrap, wrap up all, all these ideas, um, so for, kind of the challenge that I would offer our audience today, that beginning step to start closing the gap between, you know, we've heard a lot of cool things, but how do we start now having the application, those behavioral changes so this can be actual wisdom to have actual effective use of these, of these tools. This idea of beginning with the end in mind, where is it we want to end up? and to start cultivating this awareness by focusing on what our sphere of influence is. I've only got control of myself. What can I be proactively doing? And, I, and so I guess for all of us to just kind of ponder and consider, it's like, this is the space that our power, our power does lie. And that, like you said, this is an absolute journey and we can take steps all along the way and, and we'll slowly close that gap until this does you know, become more of a habit that it is integrated into who we are and how we interact with, with the world. Yeah. yeah, just to wrap this up, um, everybody is on their own journey. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the problem is, is most people don't think of their existence in the context of the journey that they're on. So they don't focus on the destination that they're moving towards and the people that or the person that they aspire to become. And oh, that's, yeah. that's a lack of awareness. You just, you're just living, you're just existing in the moment and you're complaining about the past. It's a difference. But if between, I get clear on it's like okay this is the kind of person i want to become and these are the kinds of relationships that i want to have what are the things that i have to do? i have to take personal accountability now it starts with just it's it's as simple as just reframe the mm -hmm. way you view yourself in the world that you exist in mm -hmm. most people are backwards looking right just reframe the journey that you're on and your existence within the environment in which you exist with the people that surround you, just reframe your existence as a future with unlimited potential and possibilities that mm. everything is within your control. And once you do that, your attitude changes because you're not complaining about things that are unfair, things that happened in the past. You just, suddenly those things just dissolve and vanish into nothing because your focus is future oriented as opposed to backwards oriented and if you can do that that's the first step into a larger more prosperous and happier world of existence Awesome. well here's to a happy and prosperous future for <laughs> for all of us. Jean, thank you so much for joining me today on the Ariadne Project. We have concrete, actionable steps that we can move forward with from this conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom and giving us the encouragement to take those proactive steps in our own lives. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really, really enjoyed this really authentic conversation we just had. Oh, I, I'm so, so thrilled. And for, for my audience, I will be posting links in, in the show notes. Gene has some really cool articles and, you know, all of his, you know, even bigger work, you know, doing these cross-cultural interactions. I will be posting all of that uh, to make available to you. Jean, thank you so much for joining me today. And I will see you guys all again soon with the Ariadne Project. Okay, thank you.
Woo! That was great. Yay! That was so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> so much fun. That was great. I love that. Yeah, I hope I uh, offer some valuable insights for your audience, even though I'm a yeah. male. <laughs> yeah. No, it's like I've uh, I've definitely um, you know the people because it's like it's not just women who have insightful things to to offer. Um, so it's like yeah, I'm I'm cool to interview guys and I'm cool to have guys listen. But um, it's like, what are, you know, what is this demographic particularly concerned with? And it's like, yeah, this just hit on so many, so many good things. And to start with, so it's like, okay, there are things that we can, we can do. Like communication is so huge. So this was yeah, super well, fun. Yeah. When you posted that thing in the, in the Facebook group and I looked at briefly what you're doing, I just thought that I would be actually a good fit for, to be a guest. Yeah, this is yeah, this is exactly the kind of the kind of thing. It's like yeah, we all need need steps, that roadmap that you're talking about. It's like this is something I can actually do. Cuz yeah, I like those clichés that we talk about and like why do people offer, you know, advice? It's because it's like it's the things that you know they wish they knew, but it's like how do we go beyond? It's like, well, that's a nice phrase that, you know, you post on Instagram or, you know, something. It's like to actually make it, to integrate it, to. Well, yeah. a lot of people aren't aware of this, but most people, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but a lot of people offer advice because it helps their ego. Yeah. So when they offer advice. Like where it's like, I'm helping you. Yeah. Over there. <laughs> so when they offer advice, they're actually doing it for themselves more than not doing it for the other person. There are, you know, that, that's just the way psychology works. And that's the way our egos work. And yeah. if you're not aware of that, then you sometimes find yourself wondering why people aren't listening to your advice. Yeah, it's like, let me, let me just sprinkle <laughs> unsolicited advice on all of you. And yeah, like what a different thing, like when someone asks you your opinion on something versus like, well, let me tell you how, yeah, the receptivity of that is a completely different yeah, so did you say, I'm sorry, did you say you were in Chicago? Um, I'm in Austin, Texas. You're in Texas. Okay, okay, you're in Texas. So, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, it's too bad you're not going to be going to London. Oh, is most of your team going? Uh, I think most is not, but the people who are active in the group, uh, I think they are. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's only like four or five out of my entire team that are, are going to end up, end up really? going. Which, which team were you? Team Gunner. Oh, Team Gunner won silver, right? Or We won gold, man. We won, won gold. gold. That's right. You won gold. So uh, only four people going out of the gold medal team? That's the last that I, that I saw. Um, there are some people that are more local. Um, but then a lot of us are kind of, kind of far. So, so you're going to be yeah. staying put in Texas for a while because you've just been whirlwind all over the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's like, and of course I'm like already contemplating, like, I'm pretty sure I need to go and do this next. And like, yeah, I like, I'm, cause it takes about eight months to a year to gear up for my next volunteer trip. And it's like, I'm pretty sure I need to be on this expedition that goes to the Himalayas next year. Uh, like, you know, these kinds of things. So it's like, I'm already like thinking of like all the other reasons why I should go be all over the planet. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're planning a trip, let's just say, when, when is your next trip? Himalayas? Um, I don't have a concrete date yet. Um, I think I want to take at least one small trip before my next big volunteer trip. Um, but yeah, I need to kind of start figuring out the dates for next next year but i i'm already pretty certain that that's that's the volunteer trip i need to go on um because yeah that one's kind of been on my mind for like a year and a half almost two years so it's like i'm pretty sure that one's next yeah, so well, i've i've kind of like it's almost like i've been bitten so i'm starting to become addicted to this whole vlogging and podcasting thing <laughs> so I actually, I'm actually, I actually want to create like a show like Brian's Iron Mind, mm. where 
where it's based on some journey that I'm going on. I haven't figured it out yet. But, mm. uh, but if I was going on a trip, I would start promoting it now and make a show out of it. That would be awesome. Oh. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's interesting that you say that because um, one of my mentors, she ended up doing um, a virtual pilgrimage. She did this like whole amazing like pilgrimage, like all through the holy sites of Japan and everything. And she like walked most of the way, like all these things. And she did like these live videos, like where she could, like she brought people on her journey. And it's like, that is an interesting concept that you say, you say that. Cause there's um, like when I was in Africa, like I didn't have internet most of the time, but I, it's like, okay, I could actually record things and then, you know, post them after the fact. Um, Cause yeah, definitely didn't have internet most of, <laughs> most of the time. Well, one but, of the things that I've noticed and, and because we're kind of doing something similar is when you have a podcast where you're interviewing guests, it's harder to actually get your own message out because the show is about the guest. Mm -hmm. and well, and I'm thinking that like, there's like, I mostly want to do interviews, but I do think I will be throwing in some solo episodes as well. That's I'm thinking the exact same thing you're thinking. Cause I was thinking that, you know, when I joined the, the, this London real thing, I've never thought about interviewing guests. I just thought about, putting more mm. content out there in a podcast. And then, okay, Brian says, you know, the goal is to interview guests. And I said, okay, so we're interviewing oh, yeah. guests. <laughs> but in order to be a good interviewer, and you are excellent, by the way, in order, to be, in order to be a good interviewer, you really have to let the guests speak, right? You can't make it about yourself if you're interviewing somebody else. You got to take a step back and let the audience hear what your guest has to say. But that also means that people don't get to hear your voice. And because you have such a, great voice and a great message i was just imagining that some other kind of like iron mind where you're going on this journey and then mm. you're talking about things that you observe all along the way and it becomes a show that i would watch that <laughs> man well because you know i definitely do have a curiosity because it's like i feel like most of my strength would be in more of a video format um because i get to you know be all gestury and whatever and dress up like yeah. princess leia and um <laughs> there will be a zombie video coming out this this uh by the end of the month because it's uh zombie appreciation month and i'm like oh som somehow zombies are gonna get appreciated <laughs> in one of my videos like it's happening um that i feel you know because that's what's playful and that's what's fun you know fun to me and so kind of thinking it's like okay you know i definitely could do things where i make the videos of my podcast like you know i could use that as video for a youtube channel and use it for my podcast so i'd be reaching kind of two groups that way but i also am starting to feel like a youtube thing where it's like i'm making all these like videos and stuff anyway like why am i not doing a youtube channel here because I think that's, that would that's the, that's the business side of it right? getting on yeah more, getting on more social networks that's the business side of it. but I'm just talking about the personal side where like one thing that I've become aware of in my journey is hmm. it's really almost irrelevant how good my stuff is like what we just talked about the, the stuff that I have that I want to share with the world, it's almost irrelevant how good it is or how beneficial it can be unless there's an application that people can experience. Well, yeah, yeah. And the only way that people could experience, um, that's why I'm thinking about it, but in your case, it's the same thing. The only way that people can experience Kira, talk about what's important and what her message is to just watch you on an adventure. Right. I mean, mm. that's, that's what people I'm write this see. down. Yeah, it's like, gonna write right? down because uh, it's the you that's and, and that's a great way for you to be authentic, because you're just talking about the things that you believe, and the and how it applies to the things that you observe. And then people can make the connection, okay, 
the things that Kira believes apply to the things that she observes. And now I understand how it can apply to me. It opens my imagination, right? Mm. The key to unlock true fans is just to, is their curiosity and imagination. They want to see what Kira's going to do next, what she's going to say about this. Okay, tomorrow I'm going to blah, 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 and, and, and we're going to really, you know, X, Y, Z, and then I'm going to face A, B, C, and then, okay, well, then I want to see the next show. Hmm. Right? There's continuity. And instead of post just one guest, one guest, one vlog, one vlog, that, that is a no, whole storyline. There's that have no relationship with each other other than this is what Kira's trying to do. This is an overarching theme, but to have something that is a specific storyline, that's kind of yeah. interesting. That's what that's the inspiration I got from watching Brian's Iron Man, right? He's huh. on a journey to 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 do an Iron Man on a 100 percent vegan diet. He has a countdown to the day when it starts. He uh -huh. takes a clean, for people who are interested in that, they're going to watch every show. Yeah. Right? And for your fans, if you created some kind of journey, you could start promoting it like months before you actually go on it. This is what I planned. This is the route that I'm going to travel. These are the key landmarks that I'm going to visit. These are the people that I'm going to encounter. I'm going to try to explore this and then you start promoting that through your blogs all the way up until the time you depart. And then you're blogging on the plane and talking whole, about what you feel. Time that that's your, that's a, your own Iron Mind show. Well, and you know, hmm, and I, because <laughs> I mean, definitely for some of my specific kinds of trips, like, like that would be so cool to take people. It should be every one of your trips because the only way. Yeah. If, if you develop a thousand true fans just to, who want to just follow just you what on I'm... your journeys and see what you see and see what you say, you can wrap your message around that. Well, and it's interesting because it's um, literally just last night. So this might be my next, like this would be a smaller trip. You know, it's not a volunteer trip to Africa, but um, I've been really trying to figure out ways to like really connect with my parents. And so my dad in the last couple of years has like taken up fishing and that's been like a really cool thing for him. And, um, and, and talking to my dad about, it's like, well, maybe we should go on some kind of fishing trip or, or something like to, because it's, um, I'm one of five kids. So to have any like one-on-one -on -one time with a parent, like, you know, didn't really have, you know, and to realize it's like, it's like, I've been a freaking adult living away from home for a long time. Like, why do we still like so badly, like want these, you know, but recognizing it's like, yeah, that, that these connections are important to me. And, um, and so That's literally so just true. last night I sent a message to my dad. I'm like, what do you think about fishing trips in Canada? Because I just saw this cool thing about Montreal and like, look, look at these things. And it's like, I, you know, and to tell my dad, it's like, I would like to, deliberately plan a trip with you, you know, because sometimes it's like, oh, well, next month. And it's like, oh, well, you know, time off and saving up for it or, or whatever. And so to even just send my dad that, that message. And it's like, cause it's like, what is the whole, like, real, you know, it's not just like, oh, go on a fishing trip with your dad. Like, like what, you know, what is the whole journey and the purpose behind it? It's like, I want to have an opportunity to really connect with my dad and why is that and you know and i think that, would that be desire a to have those show. relationships with our parents even as adults is something that so a, many of us that's a yeah. powerful show that in itself could be a show as long as your dad doesn't mind being on video that would yeah be i would have to like it's like so dad what do you think it's like let's catch some really awesome fish and like <laughs> But the fact that you're even considering doing something like that, and of course, the relationship between a daughter and a father, that's, that's hugely inspirational. Because everybody in your audience is a daughter, right? And 
And what better way to apply all of the knowledge and wisdom that you want to impart than on your own journey to get closer to your father or develop whatever. Mm -hmm. That's a show. That's a show. It's not well, just- Well, now I have to go on a fishing trip in Canada with my dad. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just sharing these ideas because yeah. this, is, this is the way that I'm thinking now. Where, yeah. Where, you know, it's one thing just to broadcast your message and just be a broadcaster, but how do you draw people in? Because that's mm -hmm. like the very human element. It's not just like, okay, you got an episode of this like piece of something. Exactly. but. But yeah, this very human element and you talk about cultivating trust and it's like, and that's like something that like, because from the beginning, I've known that I wanted to do solo episodes because it's like, especially in the work that I'm doing these one-on-one -on -one things with people, it's like, I'm asking people to get like really real and raw and vulnerable. And if I'm not willing to offer that same vulnerability, then how, yeah, how do we have that foundation of trust? And so I've done some of these like videos where it's like, okay, I'm going to get really real with like where I'm coming from, you know, with this. And that means putting out some of, <laughs> you know, some of it's like, what are our shadows and the things that we struggle with? And, um, and so, you know, but then, like you said, like the focus of, of this course was to be doing interviews, which I, you know, I knew I wanted to do that as well, but, um, but this kind of even like solidifies and like validates a lot of my, my own thoughts where it's like, yeah, how, how I'm do just, I really, you, I'm just telling you as a fan, what I would be more interested to see. Yeah. Yeah. Cause just to listen to your message by you broadcasting it, as good as the message as it might be, it's just not that interesting. But to see you apply your philosophies to building a better relationship with your dad on a fishing trip, being one of five daughters, that's real. <laughs> as an example, <laughs> I mean, that's real. Yeah. yeah that's real. I mean, the, the, well, key that, yeah. a, the key to building a thousand true friends is just to be real. And just- Yeah, that authenticity. Just, just being authentic on camera by broadcasting information isn't that attractive but mm -hmm. bringing people into your world and going on this really kind of journey with you to, to reconnect with your dad or whatever it may be i mean that's that's taking realness to another level well and you know and it's interesting because yeah, there's like all these like disconnected pieces and like how to integrate all it's like, okay, well, because yeah, there's more of my story and my things in my videos. And then this podcast is almost like, okay, it feeds into my work. But if you don't have these other pieces, like if someone's only viewing the podcast versus like seeing all of this. And so to deliberately create it in a more cohesive way and connect, connect it, um, that's yeah, the really podcast, the podcast is a, the podcast is just a vehicle. Ultimately, yeah. ultimately, what's important is the story and the content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? The podcast is just a vehicle to get it out to people in audio format. YouTube is a, a vehicle to get it out to people in video format. And then you have all these other channels to promote it. But ultimately, when you focus on content creation, it's about the, the story and the show, right? And it's really irrelevant whether it goes out on iTunes or not. It's just, this is the show. I mean, you could put it out on VMO or whatever channel you want. Mm -hmm. But the goal is to create the show that people who are already interested in your message can actually dig deeper into. I mean, they can, they can get more involved at a human level, right? It's not just as a student of Kira Marie's philosophies, then you know, that's only so many people want to go to school, right? Now, but suddenly, to see it in real now time. suddenly I'm involved. I'm part of the story. I'm part of the experience, right? Then suddenly, mm. oh, that's something. That's, really that's something I could get excited about. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and then it makes the business side of podcasting more, less work because now you're telling stories as part of your business. Yeah, right? yeah. See how that works? Yeah. Right. Anyway, I, like I said, I'm a coach, so I, I do some of these things naturally. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, well, this is like super, super fun. I'm glad we both got the recordings of it. I will, um, you know, and I'll send you the link when I've got it all on iTunes and, and stuff. Um, but, but yeah. And, um, cause I, I did a couple interviews this week. Um, cause that's just when people were available. I'm typically going to be releasing one episode, um, a week. And so I'll do like a promotional video thing. Um, and I'll send, I'll link you all in, in all of that. So, well, I will be sharing that on my Facebook group and, uh, I'm going to be posting some behind the scenes and linking back to your podcast on my YouTube channel. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, yeah. So that's just how the business aspect of joint ventures work. So yeah, that we can share each other's. Yeah. Yeah. So as we're doing this, uh, you know, you can expand on that with your future JV partners. Yeah, well, we'll expand our audiences. Yeah. Well, oh. it's been fun talking to you. It's been fun. Yeah. Well, and, and we're um, connected. We can obviously stay in touch. I mean, absolutely. In London, but who knows? It's when we're forward looking, who knows what the future will hold? I will embrace the uncertainty of seeing you sometime in the Sounds good. Well, I shall, yeah, I'll be in touch. All right. I'm well, gonna... you have